if your financial life is not better after I am done, I guess nothing else will help you in life. Already I am on part three of kingdom business. Money is a means, not an end. That's the topic of today's message. Money is a means and not an end. In other words, what I'm saying, it's a form of trade to get by in life, but it is not your life. Life is God. Do you understand that? Seeing money as your life can lead to selfishness, pride, hurting others, Greed, corruption, and ultimately losing your soul if your view of money is life and not just a means. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. What occasion gave rise to what Jesus said here? A man died, a wealthy father died who had two sons. And when he died, one son apparently got all the wealth. And his brother came to Jesus and said, Jesus, would you please tell my brother to share all this wealth with me? Because he took all and I got none. You would have believed that Jesus would have said, how rude is your brother? How greedy is your brother? Wow, how insensitive he is. What kind of brother do you have? But instead, listen to what Jesus said. He told the young man and he tells us today, beware. Guard against every form of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Brothers and sisters have looked at many doc documentaries. And God has given me the opportunity to meet many wealthy people that do not know God, that do not care to know God, that do not live for God. Boy, their lives are a misery and rotten. Jesus said our life is not measured by how much we own. Yet the world makes us think, that if we don't own much, own a lot, our life is a misery and worthless. And we fall for the trap again and again. Don't you realize, haven't you noticed, that no matter how much you possess, and each time you acquire something new, it makes you feel so good and so blessed, and after a few weeks, that thing seems to have no value again. That's because life is not measured by how much we own. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, it says godliness, talking to Christians here, godliness with contentment itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. I mean, that's absolute truth. Which one of us brought anything into this world when we were born? None of us. We brought nothing. And again, we might not believe it, but one day it will become a reality. Which one of us can take anything when we die? None of us. We can't take nothing. Therefore, contentment is the game. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 2 tells us something very beautiful. And if we would only learn that God made people differently and we don't need to strive to be somebody else. In verse 2 it says, the rich and the poor have this one thing in common. The Lord made them both. God made the rich. And God made the poor. He did not make the person who wants to be rich. And he did not make the person who wants to be poor. He made the rich. And he made the poor. The problem is we're trying to be what we're not. 
you talk to most people that are rich, you'll find out that it was built in. It came natural for them to multiply money. It's like opportunities just came their way without necessarily looking for it. And after some years, they became wealthy. While you have some people that do everything in their power and try to use somebody else's power and they're still broke. They're still poor. It serves us well to determine on the inside what God created us to be. I'm here to tell you today that if God made you to be rich, without you running after money, you will become rich. But if God made you to be poor, and when, I'm, when, I'm, when I use the word poor, I'm not talking about just flat on your face having nothing. Meaning, you have just enough to get by happily in life. If God made you to be that way, doesn't matter what you do, you can, you can attend the best financial university in the world, and you won't get it. God made some people rich, and God made some people poor. God wants us to find our place in life. Because money is a means. It's not an end. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, it tells us when God made somebody poor and all they want to do in life is try to become rich, watch what happens. It says, but people who long to be rich. You know, most people that became rich never long to be rich. I'm letting you into some secrets. I've spoken to many people who are dirty wealthy. And they never dreamt to be rich. They just became rich. But people, Christians especially, who long to be rich are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and fall into many sorrows. You see, next week I'll talk to you about getting out of financial debt. And one of the things I'll mention to you as I open my sermon next week is to let you see from the word of God that God created blessings to chase you. He never created you to chase blessings. Matthew 6, 26. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? You see, losing your soul is not something that happens overnight. Have you ever heard of the story of the frog that was put in cool water? Let me tell you quickly. The story says there was a frog that was placed in a pot on top of the stove and the pot had water in it but it was cool and as the pot was exposed to the fire underneath the water became warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer, and warmer until finally the water became so hot yet the frog died in the water and never sensed his death because he was desensitized. Now, if you would take that same frog and you threw him into an already boiling water, that frog would jump out the moment he hit water. But that's what happens in the world today. Slowly but surely, we become desensitized by the world's system until finally we do not realize that our soul is actually on the line. In exchange for what? Money. Something that we can't even take with us. The word of God. The ones that most of us don't read. The word of God seeks to break man's way of doing things. Which binds them in a mess. Do you know how many Christians are in a financial mess today? It's because we don't live by the word of God. And yet the word of God is what brings success. Listen to this. In John 15, 7 and 8. 
It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Well, let me just say this. To remain in God is not just attending church. It's not just singing worship songs. It's not just even reading the Bible. To remain in God is to obey the word of God. And Jesus said when you obey the word of God, it says you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But the big mistake we make is we attend church every Sunday. We sing the beautiful songs, but our lives are still in a mess. Why? Because first of all, we don't know the Word of God. And second of all, when we get to know the Word of God, we choose not to obey the Word of God. Listen to me. You can pray from now to kingdom come. If you do not abide by the principles of the Word of God, you will never get ahead of li in life, even though Jesus is your Savior. You think I am where I am today? Because God loves me more than you? You think I am where I am today? Because I believe in good luck and bad luck? I am where I am today. Because when I read the word of God, I believe the word of God and then I do the word of God. You have the same option. And only you can make the choice. Listen to what Joshua 1.8 says. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Not just some. People have a bad habit. Christians have a bad habit of not reading the Bible. And then all of a sudden when they're in trouble, they pop a couple psalms. And they start to pray it and read it. So that you may be careful to do. So it didn't say just meditate upon it. It didn't just say do it. I mean read it. It says be careful to do it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Psalms 37 5 says, Commit everything you do to the Lord, not just some things. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him, and He will help you. Commit everything you do to the Lord, trust Him, and He will help you. What does the Bible mean when it says, Commit? Whatever you do to the Lord. Or commit everything you do to the Lord. It means several things. And here are some of them. To commit everything you do to the Lord. Is putting him first to everything else in your life. First. Not just sometimes. Not just second place. First. In every single thing. In your marriage he is first. In your finances, He is first. In your spiritual life, He is first. In your education, He is first. In everything, He is first. Secondly, your desire for promotion is not the driving force in life. Oh, if I'm only promoted, I'll have a little bit more money and things will go a little bit better for me. Who says so? You know, you remember when COVID hit two years ago and everything was locked down, there were no jobs and people thought they couldn't live on $50 a week and they did really well living on $50 a week. So we can, but it's greed that fills our heart. Your desire for, for promotion is not the driving force in your life because the more you get, the more you spend. Do you know that? Your job performance is not geared for a pay raise. You work as on the God. Your job security is not the issue in life God is. Your need to open for business or work on Sundays is no longer the priority. Some people might think, Pastor, if you know what? You got life good, you got life. If you would only be in my shoes, I once was there. I like this one better. Opening on Sundays, working on Sundays. You might say, Pastor, 
You don't know my job situation. How I'd love to get off on Sundays. You know what I've noticed? Now remember, Christians serve the living God. Every other religion serves false gods. Anywhere in this world, take a look at Jehovah's Witnesses. None of them work on their holy day. Doesn't matter where in the world. They never work on their, and some of them hold some prestigious jobs. Take a look at the SDAs. The Adventists. Take a look at them. Not one of them work on Saturday. They're all out there everywhere. And all of them get their holy day off. But Christians are always the babies. Never grow up. Christians are the only one that has to give God the excuses. Oh Lord, you know. Commit everything you do to the Lord. You know, the owner of Chick-fil-A in the States, it's a large fast food company all over America. As a believer, he decided he will not open his chain food business on Sundays. And he didn't. He still doesn't. And you know what? When he decided to do that, he didn't lose a penny. God brought in enough from Monday to Saturday. And when he did his accounting, he realized that even now I don't open my business on Sunday. I make just as much. Thing is, we don't try the Lord. We think the Lord will let us down. The world sees these things as uncompromisable if you want to succeed and be in success. Yet the believer needs to understand and establish in their hearts and lives that it is God who will make us prosper. Not the rules or the pressures of this life. It is God. You are his children. But we live so much under the conditions and the demands of the world. And then the kingdom of God pays a high price for it. Listen to what Proverbs 10 and verse 22 says. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich. Now we're talking about Christians here. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes a Christian rich. And then God does what the world can never promise you. And he adds no sorrow with it. Boy, I've been around wealthy people, I'm telling you. And the misery is deep and steep. Because there is a price to pay to become rich in the world without God. And yet the Bible says for the believer, if God created you to be wealthy and you trust Him, God is the one that will open doors, bring opportunities, grant favor, and God will make you rich. And then He says, I will not allow any sorrow to come in your midst when Becoming wealthy. It is Him. Yet we live by the standards of the world. Listen to this. You think God can't make people rich? In Genesis chapter 24 verse 34 and 35. I am Abram's servant. Let me give you a backdrop. The servant of Abraham was going to go to look for a wife for his son. Abram gave him instruction, and so he went. And by the way, the end of the story, it happened exactly the way Abraham said it would happen. But here is what the servant said. I am Abram's servant, he explained, and the Lord, look at the underline, the Lord has greatly blessed my master. He has become a wealthy man. Go back and read the account of Abraham. He learned to obey God to the T. And God blessed him. The Lord has given him flocks of sheep, goats, herds of cattle. And watch this. A fortune in silver and gold. Abraham became rich because of the blessing of God. I like this one. 
Genesis chapter 26 verse 12 and 13. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted for the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. Now, does that sound exciting to you? Well, let me tell you why this is very exciting. Let me give you the backdrop of this scripture. A severe famine had hit the land. People were dying everywhere. And some were taking off and going to foreign land. And Isaac was one of them. Isaac was about to go to a foreign land just so that he and his family would not die. And God spoke to him. And God said to Isaac, do not leave this land. I'll bless you here. And then he told Isaac. He says, I want you to plant your seeds now under this condition in this land. Could you imagine what a fool he must have looked like? How stupid he must have looked in the front of all the people of that land? Who in the world plants seeds in drought? Go to a farmer and ask them if that's sensible. Nobody plants seeds in the ground when the land is parched and it won't rain for years to come. And you know what God said to Isaac? God said, plant your seeds here now and I will bless you. Against all odds, the Bible says Isaac planted his seeds and he harvested a hundred times more than he planted. He became very wealthy in the ad most adverse situation. He became wealthy. No wonder it says, it was the Lord that blessed him. You know, I respect everybody in this building and those watching. But I want to be sincere with you. When you feel like you don't have enough money to pay all your bills, it's not time to run to another district, to a foreign land. Because when we do that, we're telling God, God, you're over there, but you're not here. God, you're working over there, but you're not working here. It's time to sit down and pray and to believe God where you are, that God can prosper you in adversity. God still makes people rich. God still produces wealth for his children. The problem is we don't obey. We do our own things. And then we ask God to bless the mess. Deuteronomy 8.18 8, Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to become wealthy. You think it's human ingenuity? You think it's education? The Bible says, remember the Lord your God. Don't forget him. Don't put him on the back burner. Remember the Lord your God. Keep him first. Put him first. Honor him. Love him. Worship him. Give him your all. It says, because it is he who gives you the power to become wealthy. You see, when God doesn't make us wealthy, and by chance the devil make us wealthy, we mess up our lives, and we mess up the lives of other people. Proverbs 8, 21. Those who love me. Didn't say those who attend church. Didn't say those who sing their favorite songs. It says those who love me inherit wealth. I will fill their treasuries. The way the world runs money, for the believer, it repels. We have to learn how to run money the way God says to run money. Let's look at profitable solution very quickly. Because we need the money, we have to work on Sunday. Well, that doesn't that sound reasonable? Pastor, if I don't work Sunday, I won't eat. I'm sorry. You may not understand, but God does. Who said God does? Check the word of God. 
Because we need the money, we have to work on Sunday. We need to open our business on Sundays. We're talking about seeing money as a means and not as an end. You see, the world sees money as an end. I can't live without it. I can't do without it. I must have a certain amount and I must do anything I can to make a certain amount. If not, I cave under. That's profitable solution. And in the profitable solution that the world offers, God is nowhere to be found. But for the believer, we have to learn to honor him, to love him. Why would someone choose to work on Sunday? Why would someone choose to open their business on Sunday? Simple, because I need the money. You know the devil is such a liar. He will make you make a little bit more money on Sunday just to keep you bound. Just to keep you on his side. I have to open my business. I have to work because I need the money. That is seeing money as an end and not as a means. That's like saying if I don't work, I won't make it. That's a lie. God is the one that makes us make it. But remember... Money should be your servant, not your master. It is not money that makes the believer succeed. It is doing God's will. You see, money makes a beautiful servant. But it's a terrible master. Well, is it God's will not to work on Sunday? Look at the seats that are empty this Sunday. Last Sunday it was full. This Sunday seats empty. Where are the people? Probably working on Sunday. Adventists don't. Jehovah Witnesses don't. They, they make sure they get their holy day off, but Christians do. Because we're the ones with least faith. Even though we're the ones that have the real God and should have real faith. Is it God's will not to work on Sunday? Yes. Let me show you. Exodus 28 through 10. Remember to observe the Sabbath day. I have enough scripture to prove to you why Sunday is the Sabbath day for the Christian. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes your sons and your daughters. It didn't say that the seventh day is a time for the beach. It says it's a time of rest dedicated to the Lord. Here's what that translates to. That one day, you faithfully take that one day and offer it to God. It will give your body much needed rest. Some of us wonder why I have to be at the doctor every so often. And why does the doctor have a big two-story house and I'm still renting? Secondly, that one day will prove to God you trust Him to provide for your needs. Thirdly, that one day proves God's kingdom is priority in your life. That one day proves to God your family comes before money. Do you know how many families are suffering in the world today unnecessarily? Because the head of the home, the man works Sunday to Sunday with the excuse because I have to provide for you darling. And one day darling left you a note and said you're not my darling anymore. Because I didn't marry your money, I married you. You might say, how can I commit my job to God? Thank you for asking. Here's how you can. Honor the Lord on his day with your job. Start to pray about it. Start to pray. God's bigger than your boss. He is Lord. He is the boss of all boss. If you have to work on Sunday, start to pray. Lord, I want to honor you on Sunday. Please help me, God. Open the doors that I get a job where I could rest on Sunday and honor you and go to church. Instead of taking the nonsense from the devil. Secondly, 
Refuse too much overtime because you need the money. Thirdly, give to God the first fruits of your paycheck. You see, when you don't give God his tithe, his money first, what happens? All kinds of things start to happen when you get your check. Oh boy, I just remember this. I just remember that. Finally, you left nothing for God. But if you take it out first and you give it to God, his 10%, doesn't matter what comes next. It's already in an envelope. Sorry, belongs to God. You might say, how can I commit my business to God? Honor the Lord on his day. Might sound impossible because all we've known is what the world has taught us. Treat your employees with more value than money. Thirdly, pay your employees above normal legal wage. Fourthly, give God your first fruits from your revenues. Fifthly, put your immediate family before your business. Take time for your family. Money is not an end. It's just a means. When money is perceived as a means... God will always be first. Family will always be second where it should be. Others will always be third and your job will be last. Now the world has that just the opposite. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God will generously provide all your needs. God will. Remember I told you in the part one of this message, of this sermon, I said to you that God can and God want to, but it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that he will. We must meet the requirements. We must learn to obey. We must learn to do things God's way. God will generously provide all your needs. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. How do you know when you are prosperous? How do you know when you're a financial success? It's not when you can look at your bank account and say, I have six figures. It's not when you can walk around in your yard and say, I have my house. I have it all fully furnished. I have every, look at this. Boy, have I succeeded. No. True success is measured by plenty left over to share with others. When we have been blessed by God enough to where we have and there's left over, Success can be declared when we're able to help the needy, when we're able to help the poor. But if we are still poor, we need help. We can't help. Proverbs 24, 1 says, The earth belongs to the Lord and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. Everything belongs to God. Why do we not trust Him? Why do we tend to think that if we don't do it, God won't? When everything belongs to the Lord, even you. More than that. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8, it says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Everything in the world that we all long for. The gold in your beautiful set of teeth belongs to God. The gold on your ears belong to God. It all belongs to God. 